Hey everyone, here we are again. I am the ESOP guy and we are on a journey to an ESOP. Now, some of you might know I live at the beach and I live on the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Every morning I wake up, I, I get up, I have a cup of coffee and I look out at the ocean. Um, sometimes I don't want to go to work, but I have to. But anyway, that the point of that is I kind of stare out there sometimes and I imagine, um, and I shouldn't do this to myself, but I imagine that the waters are teeming with sharks and um, I, I rarely see any sharks, by the way, but I do imagine that sometimes. And so swimming in the ocean can be sometimes a little bit like just a, a leap of faith thinking, hey, nothing's down there and that's going to eat me up. Um, and it made me want to talk today about um, what the uh, ocean is like in a competitive environment, what we call the the red ocean. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but after after this, as we get started. That's enough. Oh, it's crazy. So I know that you know this movie. If you don't, I'm sorry to even share it with you. It's Jaws, the original Jaws movie, 1975, which at that time, I think I was five years old. So um, absolutely terrible to even watch this movie and then go to the beach because it'll just it'll freak you out. So what we're going to talk about today on the journey to an ESOP is this idea of um, one of the one of the best business books I've ever read in my my career it was called Blue Ocean Strategy. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into that, pardon the pun, and um, and talk about the difference between a blue ocean versus a, a red ocean. And, and one of the reasons I want to do this now is the timing of the year right now, which we're kind of moving into the end of the year. Um, I personally or professionally am going off to retreat with my partners. Um, tomorrow. So I thought it would be great to be thinking about business strategy and how important it is to be um, thinking about, you know, your future plan. And so um, this podcast, as we have put this together really as a resource to help folks that um, really are are thinking about trying to use an, an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan as part of their business planning. And that might even be part of your blue ocean strategy, by the way, but I'm not going to get too deep into that in the intro. Um, if you're a very first time listener, then I can tell you right now, I'm not, I don't do a lot of gruesome movie stuff. It's just, this was, this was just kind of at the top of my mind. So I'm like, Hey, I'll do that. Um, but most of the time I'm doing stuff just to help you kind of take, um, take on the challenge of better understanding what an ESOP is. Um, challenge against some of the myths and, and I'd say misconceptions that are out there um, relative to ESOPs. And know this, that of course it's not for everybody. An ESOP is not for every single selling shareholder out there, but it is a very highly popular viable option. And what I love about ESOPs is the more people start to get to understand them, and this is partly why I love doing the podcast, and the the better they they will look at their options and the opportunities. It doesn't mean that they're um, going to jump in and like you know just go ahead and start this whole process. But it, I think it's the, it's being able to slowly think about what would this look like if you were um, going to use this in your in your company. So that's what this re- this is what this podcast is all about. If you want to know more about it or look into it further, please go to our website at journeytoanesop.com. And you can check out all of that. So today, if you're wanting to listen more, really what I'm going to get into is this book called Blue Ocean Strategy that um, I think it was published back in 2004, 2005. And 
it really is, I think, a, a good, when I think about how it relates to the ESOP world, it's very good in the sense that it helps you start thinking about the future um, in your strategic planning. It helps you to understand, like, as as you have business units or, or profit centers or areas where your company is is very niche or very, ex, you know, in a sense, exclusive and it's hard to compete with you. Um, your valuation is going to be much better, of course, than in a company that has less and less of that. So, um, of course, kind of thinking about how do you build a stronger value is going to be part of it. How do you create a, a more sustainable, um, a, not just forget ESOPs for a second, just a richer company in the sense of sustainability, having more options, having more cash flow. Those are all going to be part of this, uh, what we're going to talk about or, ex- you know, the result of doing that. Um, and so as we, as we go into that, I wanted to kind of start off with the idea behind, um, the movie and just use this quickly into, in terms of our metaphor. If you haven't seen the movie, I just want to say, probably don't even want to watch it. It's pretty gross. Um, but if you, if you haven't seen it and you do want to watch it, please, please don't go to the beach. Um, it's a classic movie and the music score was really great. And you heard a little bit of that. Um, but this crazy demonic shark is a, a great white and it's coming into this town and um, and basically people that are, are going to the beach um, are getting eaten up and then there's the, a cop that's basically going to try to stop the shark and he um, ends up working with this guy and this this crazy captain of this boat and um, eventually um, you know they, they're basically going to have to take out the shark right so um, I won't spoil it if you do want to see the ending of it. But the point is, is as soon as I saw that and, and looked at this video um, clip of, of some of the old, you know, I haven't seen this movie since I was probably much littler, much smaller, <laughs> much younger. I'm sorry. Um, I haven't seen this video for a long time. Um, I saw the red waters and I thought, oh, you know, red waters versus blue ocean. Um, perfect example. Aesop guy. Why, why are you doing this to your people that listen to you? Um, blue ocean is this feeling and this mindset and this sense of when you're in a blue ocean, you are absolutely doing, um, you know, you're leading the marketplace and you're, you're, you really don't have a lot of competition and you can, you know that because there's not a lot of price sensitivity to, um, what people are asking for your, your price. You know that because there's a demand for what you're doing. Customers are coming to you, um, and the red ocean, you kind of know that because you're, uh, you're, you know, you're win, you're counting your win loss ratio and that your loss ratio is getting higher and you're, you're, you're dealing with commodity type of pricing where, you know, everybody's trying to get the lowest, lowest margin. Um, you're dealing with very razor thin, low margins. And, and let me just say this before I jump into too much, um, of, hey, so, you know, categorizing a company between blue ocean and red ocean. You know, there's companies that compete and I don't want to, I don't want to demean or diminish or, or say anything less. Like if you're a, if you are a company that's competing in a, in a marketplace where there's a lot of competition and you're doing well, um, Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you're making money. There's no, don't worry about that. It's the idea though of this is, this is kind of like my business um, philosophy anyways, is, is how do I continually improve my company? How do I continually look for opportunities, even though, and like our business, you know, I'll just say it like as a CPA firm, we have multiple parts of our, our business that are, they're very commoditized. Um, the audit, for instance, is, is commoditized. And some of the services that we have that are just kind of, they're, they're going to face more and more automation. You're going to see more and more of those types of things happen for us and for businesses that are, that are dealing with that. You know, the idea is that the more I can layer in other types of revenue sources that have less and less commoditization or less and less, you know, red ocean type of, of scenarios, the more profitability I'm going to have, the, the, the easier it is going to be for me to pivot when the economy turns. And let me just tell you right now, um, the economy eventually will turn. And I know that we had such a good, um, run for the last several years, um, you have to prepare for that. And so I'm a big advocate for, for strategic planning. I'm a big advocate for, for doing things different, you know, and changing things up over time, not getting stuck in the um, 
sense, hey, this is always going to be like it is. So I'm I'm encouraging you to think about this as and really exposing you to this concept of a blue ocean strategy to kind of think about your businesses a little different and take the time over the next month before the end of the year, if you haven't planned one, to try to do some type of offsite retreat and get out there with your leadership group and really kick around some ideas. This may be something that you want to use and this may be something that really doesn't appeal to you. So as we as we think about it, I, I wanted to share with you, um, and now we have the idea between what is a blue ocean or what is a red ocean, just some examples of companies that you see in the marketplace that you know could be described as more blue ocean versus the red ocean. Um, you know, and a good example of this was back when Netflix first came out and they were competing um, directly with Blockbuster. A lot of people, younger people don't even know who Blockbuster is, but Blockbuster was the dominant player when it came to, I'm going to go to the video store. We called them videos back then. I'm going to rent a movie. Um, Netflix came in with something that was just absolutely unique. Um, was able to stream out the movies and do it at a at a monthly fee, um, super convenient, super cheap. Um, as related to going to there and looking at the blockbuster movies and blah blah blah. The rest is history. Blockbuster is gone. Netflix is remaining. Um, Uber. Uber was founded in 2009. Customers looking to get from point A to point B without their own vehicle had to rely primarily on taxis. You know, and um, what what's cool about living through a um, a transition like Uber is I think everybody remembers this and it's like you know you're literally so used to getting out of the airport going getting your taxi and going from there and everything just completely changed when Uber came up with a way to do this so much cheaper and so much more convenient too because it's on your phone you don't have to deal with the guy that's you know um, hustling you for the taxi and hey this is all going it's just you felt I don't know I think taxis were um, not not unsafe, but I think an Uber, it just felt like, hey, this is a little bit easier, a little bit more convenient. Another example of Blue Ocean strategy would be Cirque du Soleil. Even though the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey owned the circus space, it took less than 20 years for Cirque du Soleil to achieve the level of revenue. Um, it took those guys more than 100 years to reach. So when Cirque du Soleil entered the circus industry, it was not an attractive place to build a business. Why would you ever do this? Um, but they had a perspective on a competition-based strategy, which um, essentially succeeded quickly and dramatically. And so instead of appealing to children, Cirque du Soleil created a new market audience, adults and corporate clients who were really willing to pay a premium price for a one-of-a-kind entertainment. So these are good examples, I think. And you could probably see a lot of different examples if you start looking at some successful business models and successful business companies, like who's getting um, the attention of other people. And so what I wanted to say is is it all starts somewhere, right? And um, that somewhere is like having people – kind of do what we're doing right now and just start dreaming a little bit, I guess, in a sense of, of saying, hey, what what does it take to create my own blue ocean strategy? And that's and that's what we're going to cover today for companies that are thinking about going towards an ESOP because I think that, that one of the things that you get into with an ESOP company is going through the journey to an ESOP is creating my marketing, my, my presentation for the trustee in my due diligence list. And one of the things about that is as much as much as we want, you know, to put together something that's real and concrete and business planning, we also want to put in ideas about how the future is going to look in this in this industry that we're in. And when you connect the reality with the possibilities of innovation um, in a business plan, I think you can really directly add value to the financial forecast, and you can add value to how you're actually presenting the numbers. And um, so, so that's a little bit of a, a, you know, stretch in the sense of, hey, I'm coming up with some great new ideas, and I'm going to throw all that in a business plan and, and sell it to a trustee. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying, how do we tweak what we already have to make it more and more blue ocean as we start thinking about it? So, so just keep that in the back of your mind as we as we go through the process. Um, and I think again, it's for it's really this is for any company, any business, anywhere. Um, when you get down to it, so the first things are just the idea behind um, what it takes to have um, 
and really implement a the blue ocean concepts. Um, the first really is this idea that you need to have the my, a shift in your mindset, and this involves um, expanding your mental horizons and thinking, and shifting your understanding of where opportunity lies. And I, I'd say all that because and I hate saying the word innovation because it's used overused by everybody, but I'm saying that because I think you have to prepare yourself to think a little bit out of the box. Um, just because something has worked for this many years, and I'm not saying it shouldn't work on the future, doesn't mean you shouldn't try other things um, and experiment in business with with new concepts. And so one of the things I like to do to help encourage a broader mindset in my company is to really get in more people in, involved at, at younger levels and different generations that help to promote um, a different way to think about things, and so how do you how do you do that is really up to you and your and your culture. Um, but I do think it's important to connect the planning process and the idea generating process with um, more than just you know one or two people in your company. Um, how do you how do you create a cultural mindset that thinks about business differently? And this is a fundamental principle when it comes to ESOPs, because ESOPs are a very, from a cultural standpoint, are a very inclusive type of culture that says, hey, we're all in this together. Ultimately, when this thing is an ESOP, we're all going to win. If we all win together, we're all going to win together financially as well. So anyway, that that's a lot to say about mindset, but I think you want to um, challenge your norm in that. Secondly, would be tools, using practical tools. Um, I'm going to share a couple of these tools in this podcast session, but I will tell you there's a bunch of tools out there and there's a lot of consulting people in the blue ocean world that will be more than happy to help you. If you want that kind of help, go on Google and just go after like some of these tools and use these to start kind of breaking apart your, um, the process that you're going through. So that's, so that's just in general. So the mindset and the tools, um, and just get the process of doing this with people and getting in a sense of like, um, anytime you're going to try something new, I think you're going to want to get people um, to embrace the change and stand behind it. So I think ultimately having a commitment from your people to say, we're not just going to um, talk about this. We're going to actually try to implement some of these things. So I think those are going to be important as you start out the process of um, of getting into this. Now, so let's describe um, a blue ocean, like a blue ocean strategy versus a red ocean strategy. Um, so a red, or, or go backwards, a red ocean strategy versus a blue ocean. So compete, a red ocean strategy is competing in existing market spaces where a blue ocean is creating an uncontested market space, which can be in love, different gradients of that. It can be bigger or smaller. Um, the red ocean, it, the goal is to um, beat the competition. How are we going to beat the competition? The goal of the blue ocean is how are we going to make the competition irrelevant? How are we going to make the competition not even sh- be able to like show up? Right. Um, the the next thing would be in a red ocean is how are we going to exploit the existing demand that's there? So um, you know this is true with with a lot of you know like home building companies and like we have this much demand coming in when the demand's good our home building goes. Um, goes really good. So all the, the tide raises all the ships and everything else. But in a blue ocean, how do we create and capture new demand? Or how do we create new demand? So again, go back to the Cirque du Soleil example. They created a demand by, by establishing a new target market, which was instead of appealing to the kids, I hate to say this kind of, but the kids don't have any money, right? in a circus, they come in a circus, but adults and corporate clients have money. So they created a new demand among a target market that didn't really think about the circus as a, an appealing option for entertainment. In a red ocean, you're going to make the value cost trade off. So you ever heard that whole, I'm going to like look at the cost benefit and just see what that's going to be. Um, in a blue ocean, you're breaking the value cost trade off in the sense that you're providing something that is beyond the idea of just behind like what I'm going to have from a financial decision. Now I'm saying that like, I think almost every business when they do anything, when they spend money on something um, or a customer spends money, there's always a cost benefit 
you know, and sometimes it's, but it's, I think the key of this is, is sometimes it's not purely a financial situation. It is, um, there are other aspects that affect the way people make decisions in their buying. <clears throat> so keep in mind, so we kind of wanted to go through that just to compare what it looks like. Um, when we look at the, one of the first tools I wanted to point out to you is what you'll find is called the eliminate, reduce, raise, and create grid. Um, I would say this is something, um, this is a tool that I've specifically used in my own planning. And what it does is it starts off with the category of eliminate. And it asks the question, which factors that the industry has long competed on that should be eliminated? And so you can start thinking, for example, um, um, I think the first thing I think of, like with Southwest Airlines in this question, is one of the things Southwest Airlines did, if you remember way, way, way back in, when they first started, is they eliminated the idea behind a seat assignment. And it's like, oh, that's that's kind of crazy because everybody's going to just have chaos if they don't have a seat assignment. And they created more of a of a bus type of um, approach where whoever gets there first gets the seat kind of deal. Um, I shared with you on one podcast how much anxiety sometimes that causes me because I got to click on to get the A zone. But at the very end of all that, it is um, – you know, it was a very shrewd move and nobody else did it. And so definitely blue ocean when you think about this. Um, so, the, so that's the eliminate category. And so what you can do with this is we're going to go through each one of these, but what you can do this with is just kind of brainstorm under that. What factors could you eliminate, um, in the, the current competition that, that nobody else is thinking about or just get out of the box and just do it? Um, and one of the things I will challenge you to do is, is, Throw crazy ideas down there. It doesn't mean you have to do it. It just is crazy ideas sometimes can be like no seat assignments can be, wow, you know what? That just might work. So think about it that way. All right. In the ERRC grid, again, the next thing would be, what are we going to raise? So it's eliminate, then raise. Raise is which factor should be raised well above the industry standard. So what does that mean? So right now, in the event that, um, if you think about Cirque du Soleil, what did they raise? They raised the ticket prices. Um, they raised the the quality of the actual um, event. I mean, by having um, really cool acts and and you know high level talent that world, I guess world class talent. When you think about it, they raised those stand industry standards and then eventually they were able to raise you know or concurrently they were able to raise the ticket prices and make really good money at it um, which things would you reduce which factors should be reduced well below the industry standard so not in this case not eliminate but we we want to dial back on something in the way that we're approaching different things so reducing could be things like if you look at the er RC thing, when we're thinking about the re reducing type of things that we'd be looking at, which factor should be reduced well below the industry standard would be things like paperwork, you know, and one of the, one of the things that I love the most, honestly, in the last couple of years is how the, the DocuSign company came out and reduced the uh, amount of time it takes for us to get documents signed, you know, going into a client meeting and, and saying, Hey, we've got this engagement letter or we've got this document to sign in order to to get this set to go it's like so easy so that was such a valuable way for uh, DocuSign to create um, what I believe is a, a very strong blue ocean type of strategy now creating itself like creating something that hasn't been done or exist um, one of the best examples of that as we mentioned before is the uber company and how uber created a uh, a way to buy uh, mobility services, which, you know, the terminology is like, hey, I'm in, I need a ride. So people like to say mobility services, but they created um, a way on your phone to connect technology wise to, to drivers. And so offering that created the, the really the, the, um, the, the, the value of what they brought to and created a, a demand for something that, that didn't exist in the, in the, in the current economy. So, 
all of these types of things will help you. And, I, and again, I come back to go through the, those types of ERRC thought processes with your leadership group and then make lists, which factors should be created that are, that our industry is not offering. What could we do, you know, raise above the industry standard? What can we eliminate that really shouldn't even be there? Like the, the, the seats and then um, what could we reduce? And so these just get things moving, I think, in terms of creating um, the ideas that will then use, be used to, um, provide a holistic blue ocean strategy, which may be all of those combined in unison together, working together um, to help your company uh, accomplish it. Now, what's going to come up with one of the things that comes up with building a good strategy for a company as they move through this process, um, whether it's blue ocean or any uh, any strategic plan, is going to be the the issues of strategic execution, which is like great ideas. And I don't know how they're going to get done because of certain issues. We try a lot of things and nothing ever happens. And I um, wanted to point out that I think every company has certain hurdles to deal with. And I'm really looking at, I'm just borrowing a lot of this stuff from the Blue Ocean people um, that really provide all this. So this is just exposing you to the idea that how do I, how do they then prepare to execute my strategy. And so they are, they have offered kind of some tools and this is another tool. It's four hurdles to strategy execution. And in this, they talk about the specific hurdle. So the first would be the cognitive hurdle, waking employees up to the need for a strategic shift. Um, red oceans may not be paths to future profitability growth, but they may have served the organization well historically. So why change? Why rock the boat? So the cognitive hurdle um, and let me say this, it could exist, you know, in organizations that have a very dominant um, leadership group, maybe one or two dominant leadership groups. That can be a more of a hurdle because we don't want to do anything that we haven't done before. And so, you know, and I'm just going to say if, if, you know, there's two things I want to say about that. First off, I do believe that it's good for an organization to change and grow and continuously improve. But I also have a deep respect for people that have helped build and founded companies. And sometimes people that are young, and I was young once, and I remember thinking this a lot when I was younger, that these guys don't know what they're doing, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that I I appreciate my, my founding partners and all that. But to be honest with you, I kept thinking to myself, "I, I know I could do this better than them. And then when I got in that seat to actually make these decisions, um, as the managing partner, it's, you know, I, I could tell you, I didn't see some of the things that I needed to see during that, during that time where I thought I knew everything. So let me just throw out the cognitive hurdle is really important. And I would challenge everybody to think past the status quo, but I also want to just say, you know, take a step back if you're younger and you're not getting things done, um, or you don't see your organization leadership kind of embracing change like they should take a step back and realize that there's a lot to learn and experience really does matter. And, um, I believe respect for people that have done, you know, built something, um, is really important in the process for, you know, culture. And it may not need to happen Im- immediately or overnight. So second resource, the second hurdle would be the resource hurdle. So assuming there's, um, you know, what you're wanting to do in your, in your blue ocean strategy, you're going to have to identify resources that you may not have. That could be talent. That could be capital. That could be, um, the, t- the time even. I mean, cause we're so busy nowadays. Like, oh, we're, we're doing that. Now, one of the things on developing the resources that you need to think about is you are going to have to choose to give up something to get something else. So I, I would say it like this, and hopefully it makes some sense, is a writer who writes a novel has to choose which direction they're going to go. They can't, they can't throw everything down. It's just going to be overwhelming and, you know, nobody's going to read it, but they're going to have to make good decisions. And I think business planning is the same way. You have to decide if I'm going to do this, then I'm giving up something else, perhaps. So the, the really well, um, well-run companies will have a process to to decide what resources get allocated to what, and so it may not be it may not be good timing. 
you know, because everything's going so well within a certain sector. So it shouldn't stop you from trying to work through that, that issue. If it's a very good blue ocean strategy idea, um, then I think you have to challenge the organization with the, the resources it's going to need to back that idea. The motivational hurdle. The motivational hurdle is, is just essentially your motivation of your staff. And this is, um, interesting because it ties very well to ESOPs, right? Um, how do I, how do I connect my people with the concept? And we could do a whole podcast on this and I probably will on this concept of ownership thinking. How do I motivate people? in my organization where they may not really see the big picture or they don't really, you know, it's just a job to them. Um, I know going up, you know, talking through with younger people and, you know, maybe they're not as connected to the, the mission of the business, or maybe there's something is not striking a chord in their thinking. But one thing that we have to do is we have to motivate um, the key players. And so motivational hurdles, obviously, I could just tell you right now, I think ESOPs are really great avenues to help motivate people. But ultimately, it doesn't matter if you're an ESOP, if your leadership group lacks the skill set to motivate their people. And that is, to me, when I, when I look at all the list of leadership development skills, that's going to be one on the very top. That's going to be like, look, you need to develop in yourself or within your group the, the ability to motivate key people and staff in your organization. And um, so leadership is a really important element of that of that hurdle. But you can't get things done unless people are, are on the, um, the same page with you and, and care and are compelled to help to do that, to help, you know, go through all of the block and tackling it takes to get things done from an execution standpoint. So then finally would be the political hurdle. So opposition from the um, people that are in power in the organization. So as one manager put it, in an organization, you get shot down before you stand up. So um, now one of the things I, l- I really like smaller businesses, partly because of this issue, because they don't have as many political battles that have to be fought. The larger the businesses go and organi- get more organized, the more political they become because the departmental, you know, parts and facets of a company start to develop and evolve into different things. And then there's this overwhelming kind of bureaucratic mold that sets into a company. And, and so that can really be um, an impediment and, an, and in this case, a hurdle. So um, somebody sometimes has to kind of clean house and say, you know what? We are not going to, um, you know, we're not going to have an organization with that. So you might sometimes have to just really address those, um, those types of things early on in the process. And I wanted to finish with the execution side because I think it's so important to not just come up with the great ideas, but it's also important to figure out how to really implement them. Um, there's nothing more frustrating in an organization where somebody keeps coming up with great ideas. They pitch all those ideas and then nothing happens. And then people get, um, just disenchanted with the whole notion of, of doing something different in the company. So, um, so, so there's a lot to talk about with this and certainly not the expert. I wanted to, to take the time today to expose you to this philosophy, this thought process, this business planning idea, and this really just ultimately to hopefully, um, inspire you guys to think about your strategic planning coming into 2022 and what you might do right now to get ready for that. So with all that, I wanted to kind of say this. Isn't that a great score? Anyway, stay out of the red ocean. I mean, I, I was kind of too much dramatic pause there, but stay out of the red ocean. Go in the blue ocean as much as you possibly can. Uh, keep going on your ESOP. If you're if you're moving forward with somebody, I'm going to encourage you just to keep moving. Um, I think 2022 is going to be an exciting year for employee stock ownership plans and um, 
appreciate you guys listening. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast. Also check out our YouTube channel because we're doing more and more YouTube interviews. And sometimes it's just nice to see people in, in person. Um, so with that, I'll see you guys on our next step on this journey to an ESOP. Mm-hmm.